Okay. All right. So I am going to uh, like to officially introduce our moderator here for this evening. Uh, Mark is probably one of the most well-traveled individuals I have ever known. <laughs> Every time I get correspondence from him, he's always in a different location. By some random chance, I was in the post office not too long ago and bumped into Mark at a local right. post office. Like, right. you're in LA. That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but he was there. It was just fun to see him. Um, Mark has been an instructor here uh, for a long, long time, and I've known him back to our early Venice Beach days. And actually, Mark is going to be teaching a workshop for us later in, uh, in April. And I'll have Kevin put a link uh, to that workshop in the chat on environmental portraiture. So you guys can check that out if you're interested. Uh, it's going to be in an online, or no, I think Mark is an in-person class this year. I think, I think it's in there. person. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, so Mark has a lot of credits. I, I just uh, I kind of abbreviated them because you have an extensive list. So I'm just going to run over a few. Um, he has tons of editorial works and appeared in publications like Vanity Fair, Life, Time, Newsweek, Geo, National Geographic Traveler, Condé Nest Traveler, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, the London Times Sunday Travel Magazine, uh, and the Los Angeles Times. And that's just to name a few. He's got a lot of award-winning books as well. Faces of the 20th Century, Masters Photographers and Their Work, uh, The Way of the Japanese Bath, Wanderlust, Inside North Korea, Inside Iran, uh, the travel photo essay describing a journey through images, and his latest work, um, I think he's got it, got it out, it's a book about orangutans, uh, the people of the forest. So yeah. it's always good to see you, Mr. Harris. I'm going to turn the floor over to you, my friend. Thank you, Brandon. Always great to see you and, and to see Kevin living large in, uh, in Mexico, which is a nice lifestyle. We should go down and visit sometime, I think. And now we have a new friend. We have Yvonne Venegas, who, who's our guest tonight. And she just invited all of us down to uh, Mexico City. So I did. I totally, I completely did. Good. Okay, good. The, the whole group. So so the more the barrier. We'll, we'll bring our own drinks. Don't worry. We, no, don't worry. But, but no, it, 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 it's an honor to have Yvonne. I got to really know her uh, work this last week and also her background, which I've uh, it, it sort of strikes a chord with me because of your your knowledge of photography and, and history of photography. And we're, we're going to talk about that later with one of your projects, which really dates back to the, the, the very beginnings of photography. Uh, and that's the pencil of nature. But but also it's fascinating uh, about your parents' history, which, which I'd love you to go into, because that really weaves uh, into your own uh, in several directions, which is incredible. And so uh, Yvonne, uh, graduated from the ICP and then uh, UC San Diego, right? UC San Diego, right. San Diego uh -huh. with the MFA there, mm -hmm. and, and you got a Guggenheim, which is uh, as impressive as it gets. Um, <laughs> and, and so, one of the interesting things uh, I'd love you to address along the way is: is you went a very different route, where, where you were born in Long Beach and then ended up mm -hmm. in Tijuana, and we're so used to through the border crossings the other way and all the news about that. But, but you're showing a face of, of Mexico and daily life that uh, maybe sometimes with all the news and the you know, border issues that are, are lost. And I think that's also one of the fascinating things about you digging into your folks' archives. So, so let's hand it over to you. And then if you don't mind along the way, um, people can uh, put a question in the chat and then I can ask that uh, when there's an opening for that. Um, I, um, I, yes, I'm from Tijuana. I grew up in Tijuana. I was born in Long Beach there. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, I, the images that I'll be showing you right now is, uh, some of my dad's work. Uh, my parents, uh, my dad studied photography. Um, I, I'm going to start with my dad's story because it completely relates to what I do, as you say. Um, basically, he's, he began in Tijuana taking pictures, but obviously there was no schooling. There was no uh, photographers to assist. Th this was in 1968. He, he did some correspondence school, uh, the, the famous photographer's course. And then he ended up in LA uh, practicing photography, assisting photographers, and then doing... Uh, uh, there used to be companies that would send photographers door to door to do portraits and then weddings. So he learned the format of wedding photography that was not used in Tijuana, which was a uh, medium format, Hasselblad. 
and color photography. Everything in Tijuana was color, was just the people who came, I mean, photographers who went at the, to the event and the, the studio photographers were in black and white. They were classic. And what my dad brought to Tijuana after working in LA for a few years was this format where the photographs were all in color and the album covered all the wedding. All the 30 moments, there's a certain amount of moments that he learned, precise moments. So that he, he brought to Tijuana. And Tijuana and the 19, he, they opened the studio in Tijuana around 1972. They, start, they were still living in LA and they would cu start coming back to Tijuana and doing, and doing uh, you know, weddings there. And it was just like, Tijuana was in, in its beginning stages. Tijuana, you know, the society of Tijuana was barely forming. So my dad's signature became part of that social group. You no, know, the way that people identified with each other. And that going back and forward, I was born with my twin sister in Long Beach. And I'm very excited, just a parenthesis, a commercial is that I'll be showing at the Mola in Long Beach in June. So I'll be giving you information for that. I hope you guys can come. But um, anyway, this is, these moments uh, that my dad photographed were all very specific. No, they were like, a, there was a, the, like a pattern. So all the weddings sort of looked the same and they had this format that was imported from Los Angeles. But the moments that I liked I went into the archive in 2005 for the first time after I had done my first project, which I'm going to show you following this one. Uh, so these moments that were very strange, ambiguous, or anything that didn't, you know, was, that wasn't clear was uh, thrown away. So he would sit and edit and throw away the images that didn't work, the ones that were uh, kind of weird or this kind of thing where you can't tell if it's the husband or the father who's kissing her, you know, like ambiguous moments, no? And obviously these sort of moments were totally functionable for the album, no? But I like the ones that were not functionable and were not clear. And I, and I say that because I, I don't know, I've been trying to reproduce that vision in my work since. <laughs> since I, I don't know where it came from and I, I have that image of my father, like what happened first? Whether I, I, I would see these images and it was just like, what is this? This is, they're beautiful and what happened to them? Like, I, I, you know, and obviously they're all in the archive. I brought all the archive to Mexico City and I've been working with it for a while now. And, you know, since 2005, I, I did one edit, but then I, I retook the, the project in 2010. It took me a while, but I like these moments where I just find that it, it, like when they're strange, they're a little bit vulnerable. They're a little bit like, mostly there's there's just something that is not clear and like here it could be something like they see it looks like they're squashing the cake into their mouth instead of feeding each other lovingly for the wedding album no that kind of thing so this is an image that I shot for my project that I titled the most beautiful brides of Baja California this is the project that I did while while I was living in New York I, I, it was in a crisis. It was, I turned 30. I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. Like all the, you know, the, the nuns told us. And, and then growing up in the wedding photography studio, it was like I'm doing, I was doing everything wrong. So I decided to do a project about the women that I grew up with uh, and sort of come back to Tijuana while I was still living in New York. I would come back to Tijuana and photograph them and then go back to New York to edit. And this is my dad working, doing a debutante ball in 2004. And uh, so basically what I did is I was trying to find these moments that were awkward or vulnerable without yet, I hadn't looked at my dad's archive yet. I had this idea of vulnerability in my first ever project in 1994, I had thought about this idea of the moment, ambiguous moment and giving it sort of be, as becoming, uh, giving it protagonism be, uh, for it to become a protagonist in my work. I was trying to find these moments. So how did I learn how to do that? It wasn't like, obviously what I used to do to try to find these moments is to shoot a lot, no, like to shoot a lot of pictures. I, I, you know, like when I felt that something was happening, there was some action going on, I just shoot more and then something's gonna happen. <laughs> there's gonna be a good one in there kind of thing. And obviously there's a lot like this moment, which was a, a bridal shower. Um, my dad was making the official photograph and I was doing sort of the sideline photograph. Uh, I, I went with him to a lot of events while I was doing the project. Um, I was very fascinated. I became very fascinated with obviously the female role and sort of this um, inauthentic uh, way that people 
looked they, they didn't mind looking like every like the other women like there was a look of femininity that I wasn't bothered by but I was observing I was looking at it you know like these two women are dressed exactly the same they're I think I think they're married to brothers or something like that so it was kind of like you know this thing like where's the originality no no why do, why do people what are we thinking about how do we understand femininity in this social group no and this is Tijuana Obviously, my dad was photographing in the 70s. This what was in the 2000, not like 30 years later. And so, like, you know, exactly like these two girls that are not, are not twins, no? These are twins. <laughs> but I was interested in finding these moments of, 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 of strangeness. I see the work now. I've seen sort of my files of prints because I made tons of prints. And there's like, I was looking, you could tell I was looking for something. Obviously, I would find this one image and it was like that that was the, the image. I, I became a very, um, how would you say, like a specific editor. That's why I learned to edit in this project. Not like to, to find the thing that moves me, the one that I like, and sort of that's the image that, th that's how I built the whole project. Not just sort of looking at, finding these moments. And obviously parallel to that, when I photograph, I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking for. I just kind of go with the flow and find the situations that might give me something. And then but everything's connected in a project. That's why I like to work in this format, like the idea of a project. This I did for four years. And usually my projects are about that length. They're about three to four years, not the most. Um, this is also a bridal shower that my dad photographed and I was sort of uh, doing my own images on the side, no? Well, um, it, it seems like, Ivan, that you, you're going for total reality. In other words, the, the, the moment before, after, you know mm -hmm. that, that that the people become posed and artificial uh, yeah it seems like you're really capturing that moment whatever happens to be mm -hmm. within that frame that's you know messy or off i mean obviously you're you're like the picture of the two girls that have the wine bottle on the glass uh -huh. and, and the uh the portrait is that their mom that's their mom yeah creating mm -hmm. this triangular thing you know which is great so you're still obviously very conscious of your your frame, but you're capturing a very real moment that once they get set up for a shot, then they put on the artificial smile, or maybe it's a real smile or whatever, but it's it's a fascinating study for sure. It's usually artificial, I think. <laughs> usually it's like, especially, I mean, what I learned about photographing this social group and it's any, any social group that's enclosed, sort of the ones that I like, they're, they have a very specific idea about the camera. No, the camera plays this role of making them seen by others. This is in 2000 before social media. No, so so I, and, and it was interesting how I managed, uh, many things helped me become part of this situation. It was my past with these girls, my father's uh, role in, this, in the social group. Um, you know, there's many reasons why people accepted me but obviously the camera to them had a meaning and I wasn't exactly playing by the rules, no? Because this image, for example, I think it represented me more the way that I felt about my life at that moment than them. No, I wasn't exactly representing them. So, so I really, uh, I'm always grateful to my subjects that let me photograph them and do whatever I'm, you know, <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen or how people are gonna look. It, it might be a beautiful image like this one. This one, obviously the mother loves this image, no? But you never know what, what's gonna turn out, no? But um, but yeah, it's a, yes, you're right. I always like to find these, like there, there must be, vulnerability happens all the time. And when we're posing, obviously it's the one time where we control that how we're not, you know, we control not to look vulnerable, but there's always off moments, even if you just turn around and hand over a bag, or if you just, and, and you, you will see it in these kinds of projects that I, that I do, that I like to find those, those mm -hmm. moments, no? Yeah, and, and I mean, the, I, in this moment, I was barely exploring. It was like my first documentary, sort of exploration of a subject. I'd, I'd done it before, but this was actually, I had I had a bunch of questions about about everything. You know, the, a crisis sort of comes with a lot of questions and, the, and I was putting them onto the images and onto the situations that I was photographing. And, and, you know, and so once I finished that project, I started this new one, which is this image, is the image of the cover of the book. I, I, this is the first book I ever published. And it was my thesis project during my MFA. It's called Maria Elvia de Hank. 
and this is what I mean about they were preparing for the photograph for the social magazine cover, you know, like they were getting ready for that moment. And I was standing next to the photographer who was going to do that image. And I like to do this, you know, this, this is for me, this is the image now where people are not conscious of the camera. They're not thinking they're just waiting kind of thing, no, like this off moment, no. And, and this project, okay, so I'll tell you a bit about this project. Once I finished the brides or in the middle of actually the, the most beautiful brides, I, I came into this territory, which is the Hank, Jorge Hank territory. I don't, I, maybe you guys have already heard of him. He, he's the son of a very well-known and uh, corrupt uh, uh, ex-governor of Mexico City called Carlos Hank Gonzalez. Um, he, but he basically, he was the youngest, he was the youngest son of this uh, politician. He went to live in Tijuana and he became a very important and you could say beloved and hated at the same time, a, a kind of a entrepreneur. He, he brought with his, obviously with money, he brought to Tijuana, he bought or got the concession for the a racetrack in Tijuana for a hundred years. Um, now he's built the our first football stadium. So people love him. And he used to be uh, the mayor of Tijuana for a few years. He has run for governor a couple of times, but he hasn't uh, been able to get back in office. But uh, he's quite a character. And I and I mentioned him because Maria Elvia de Hank is the, his, was his wife. He actually, he was widowed in 2012 when she died. Um, but she she grew up in Tijuana. She was a, a young, beautiful daughter of a you know engineer, and she was always into etiquette. She was a, a debutante queen that my dad photographed. He, he photographed her in many occasions, and I was quite interested in her as a as a character, as a female sort of uh, main role in a in this world of Jorge Hack. Uh, sort of how do you how like I always question or ask myself how can I create a project out of a subject that um, how would you say it all the qualities all the things that it has all the characters and all the things that surround it uh, my idea was to make a portrait of her throughout the, the four years that I worked with her using everybody that surrounded her all the the people and the situations and the landscapes that surrounded her no so. I, I, I basically, what I did, I, I spoke to her, I got her permission to photograph and to get access to all these situations. There were, you know, parties and uh, private situations that we would set up for a portrait or, you know, this was in a bridal shower of her daughter. My dad went to photograph the wedding of her daughter and she actually asked me to come and photograph her, when I was, you know how it is with documentaries, sometimes I was actually thinking, how am I going to ask her? You know, because I was already in the MFA and I and I decided that this was the right uh, thesis project to do, but I didn't know how to ask her, even though I had been photographing her and, you know, photographing in her, in her place for a few years, but it, she asked me. <laughs> so that was great. So in one of the events around the wedding, I asked her, I approached her and I, and I said, I would like to do a book about you uh, and your family, no, and and obviously what what it is to me is a portrait, like a, a very extended portrait of her, with all these different nuances that you know occur around her, no, and her daughter, you know, the the girls in the green is her daughter and her friends. She wanted to study photography, so that's another way that I got access to the landscape, and I, and I was there with her, and we would create situations to photograph, and obviously the parties. Uh, the, she was very open for me to be in all of the social events that they had in this land. I, I mean, I say this land because it's a 60 acre land where some places there is no, um, it's not, there is not paved. How do you say it's all dirt unpaved. roads? Unpaved. It's unpaved. Yeah. And they would, you know, put up a giant, like, you know, like a circus tent to make a, you know, for the wedding party or something like that. So it's just kind of like this creation of, a, a class, I mean, you know, like a very uh, high class where they had a private zoo, they had their, you know, the horse racetrack, they had a, um, a like a horse a equestrian club, they had a, a school, no, and then in the, for the private zoo, I photographed the private zoo a lot, but I, 
I would like to, you know, sometimes the the vet the, the veterinarian would say, you know, I said I wanted I want to photograph, a, you know, the bears. He would say, well, you know, it'd be better if we take the bear out of the cage and put him somewhere in the land. And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. So we did an image like this. Now in the book, when you see the book, the prologue or the beginning, the only text that the book has is the letter that I sent her when she asked me to write the things that I wanted to photograph. So I sent her this, you know, oh, I'd love to photograph the zoo, the, you know, the football team. The, and I just gave her my Santa Claus list. And mm -hmm. that's sort of what, is the beginning of the book. So you, when you know there's a collection of animals and you see one bear, you understand that there's more than what you're seeing. You see, if you read the, that, just that letter is enough to know. I didn't feel the need to photograph all the bears in order for you to understand that we're talking about this particular world, no, or this universe, no? Yeah. Who was the, uh, the guy with the gun was part of a security team? Yeah, they had a like a 45 element security team for the family. Mm -hmm. And this is this is one of them. It's very common in Mexico that people with wealth uh, have bodyguards, and it's always very kind of like you know like loud. And they have the the cars are um, uh, bulletproof. Mean, bulletproof. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Oh but also, um, I, had... I mean, well, the thing is, I mean, uh, th this gentleman um, whose wife you were photographing, I mean, is involved with a racetrack, which obviously, uh, and Tijuana, you know, and the cartels and all that, there, there must be that hovering around somewhere. Is, is that accurate? Well, this is the, this is, um, this is the belief. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but obviously it's never, he's always, his name is always clear. Like he doesn't have any, any actual accusations. He's never been to jail. I think he was in jail once because they found a bunch of guns at his house but mm. it's never it's never like he has too many connections like you know he knows like it, like the father his father was one of the beginners of the pri a political party in mexico and that's one of the most powerful political parties although they're not in power right now in the you know as a as a president but they're they're powerful people and he has always managed to kind of stay clean so there's nothing you can actually prove that he's actually been related to the cartels. The, he does own the chain of Caliente, which is the betting bookies, you know, like all the, the betting books around. He's like major, I think he has a major partnership in it. I can't really say, I'm not an expert in him anymore. I used to be more aware of what he's going, you know, but in Tijuana, he, people love him. I mean, he, he set up the stadium. I mean, we have the very first football team for Tijuana, and you know, he knows how to get to people. It's very, it's a very particular character. I kind of don't have any more, like, you know, I'm not very close to him particularly because his wife is no longer around, so I don't really, uh, you know, relate with him. But um, his daughters, I'm always in contact with his daughters. Obviously, this daughter who used to be in that, she must have been like. 10 or 11 now she's you know in her 20s she's this beautiful like model looking daughter but anyway that's off the <laughs> that's extra no but anyway that that project I did from 2006 to 2010 when I published the book and then um I mean I, I, we can go if you have any questions about this project I'll be happy to well answer. what happened to the woman How, what did she pass away from she died unfortunately she had this very strange sort of cancer. It was some kind of leukemia, but it wasn't exactly leukemia. And she, for two years, she struggled with it until it just, it took over, uh, unfortunately. And that was, yeah, that was 2012. And I remember exactly the year, I, every year she gets um, mentioned by her family. And I was about to open an exhibition in 2012. For the, I was gonna show these images for the first time in Mexico City. It was kind of like a very strange, she was very young. She 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 was probably not even sixty when she died, so it was kind of it was very tragic. She she left even very young children. No, but um, I go to now a very contrasted uh, project because uh, I do these very intense sort of sociological uh, kind of you know like involved projects, and then I like to kind of go into a project that I, this was the first time I did it. It was like let's think about photography. Now I moved to Mexico City and I wanted to photo, do portraits and do black and white portraits. Why black and white just called me. It was kind of like, I need something that 
you know, takes me back to the basics, like black and white film, uh, finding people to do portraits, putting them in a situation, because everything I did with Maria Elvia, I was always sort of letting things happen for the camera. I wasn't, I, I didn't put my hand in there. I didn't say stand over here or, you know, maybe a couple of times for a couple of portraits or even that last image with the girl with the head on her plate. I was actually staring at her and then she was going to get up and I said, oh, please go back. <laughs> so I took a picture, you know, I was kind of like staring lovingly like, wow, this is so beautiful, <laughs> you know, taking it in. But anyway, and these, uh, this project to me was sort of my arrival in Mexico City, trying to get to know the city, trying to do something that was just like non-intense, you know, thing. So I, I, I look for people, I, I put a kind of, you know, like a advert on the newspaper, like looking for people to be part of an artistic project, or I ask people online or people I just met or people I knew that I wanted to do portraits, you know, with their family and their intimate spaces or in, in, in parks. People I met online or, you know, that wrote to me from the adverts, I would go to meet them in a park or, you know, usually we'd meet in public places. Some of them were people I, like this, you know, in this case, people I knew. But basically I was trying, oh, this is my son who's here. He was, now he's 10, he was just a little baby. But um, anyway, what I was trying to do with this project is, is do a project about portraiture, how I understood portraiture. So I was photographing people that I, that I found, you know, and people I didn't know, I just found them and photographed them. And, and also I wanted to photograph people photographing, which was to me the way to understand portraiture. I grew up in, growing up in a photography studio. Uh, portraiture is not just taking the pictures. There's also looking at other people taking the pictures. So I wanted to have this uh, element of photography in the book, no? sort of in this uh, uh, sort of interlace with the portraits that I did were also uh, portrait people working on portraits no so it kind of the book kind of goes from the uh, an empty space which was the first image we saw to the final this studio no it's like the empty house to the empty studio this is like here we're missing I'm missing a few of the you can see more on my website but there's basically there's some other ones of photographers working and it, it sort of goes from day into night sort of the you know the photographers working in the studio and, and things like that so that was my way of talking it was a very simple idea that I managed to kind of uh, I really love I mean I love the book and I, the text was done by this wonderful curator that's the director or the main curator of the contemporary art museum from the university here at the MOAC and anyway, that was uh, that was 2000, and we published the book in 2014 or 2013. And then this is San Pedro Garza Garcia, which was another, of course, I finished that one. And I, again, I get involved in this very intense sociological sort of, you know, related project. So San Pedro Garza Garcia is a municipality, which is part of the metropolitan area of Monterrey. And it's 150,000 people, but that's where a lot of the wealth from Mexico is sort of held because it became in around 2008 when violence was very high all over Mexico, Nuevo León, Monterrey was not saved. So the mayor of San Pedro, they became independent. Uh, I don't remember exactly the year right now, but and they had their own mayor and the mayor was also a very wealthy guy. You can see a movie called The Mayor, which is beautiful uh, about the mayor from San Pedro Garza Garcia. I recommend it if you can, if you can get access to it. I don't know where you can find it, but anyway. Um, so they, he basically bulletproofed the town or the city, no? It's 150,000 people, I guess it's the city. I'm not sure, but anyway, um, he, basically the people in this, place are not like mega wealthy like you know like the wealthiest parts of of um how would you say uh, um, in los angeles or california but they yeah. are wealthy and they have a higher standard of living than other parts of mexico so to and be even just to live there is more expensive than than monterrey which is right next door um, so you say bulletproofed it. How was he able to safeguard it? What did he do? Well, you know how you say that you, the cartels and all that. I think it has something to do with that. He negotiated uh, with cartels and he did manage to kind of really like people who threatened him. They, they, he had like a couple of attempts where they tried to kill him. 
and whoever tried ended up dead or you know like he made some kind of deals that uh, managed to keep sort of San Pedro without any violence no and it was it did last a few years and in those years that all over Mexico was very not very safe San Pedro was quite safe so a lot of people didn't leave they didn't go to Monterrey which is you know the town next door it's like the city that is actually a part of they just go across it to get to the airport kind of thing no if they didn't have a private jet there's there it's it, it's a it's a like you would say there's a lot of millionaires in this town no if you if you find millionaires in Mexico a lot of them are part of they live in or they're from Nuevo León from Monterrey no um let's see and so what i did is a very very documentary very kind of go with the people start me i i when i first arrived i didn't know anyone i started go going there and just meeting people asking other people i become very obsessed with the subject and i kind of became pretty obsessed about this one um this is the one that i got the guggenheim for which was very lucky because i it was not exactly a very sellable project i haven't actually sold any prints for you know i've sold very few prints after the project was made so during the making of the project i had a couple of grants that helped me produce it and i was really focused on it and very obsessed and sort of trying to uh, uh, what i really liked about this place is that first they had a very intense relationship with photography no there is a very uh, sort of a culture of the social magazine in this place uh, that dates back to the 70s so they understand the camera and like sometimes when i would photograph they would invite a photographer to come and photograph us when i was photographing them it was very strange no and then also i felt that the social structure that happened here was quite different than other parts of mexico and it all happened in this small place so it was very evident although i couldn't i don't think it came out in the book maybe it did but it didn't come out the way i, I wanted it to come out but eventually, you know, what, what happens in the book, the book was published in 2019. Eventually what happened in the book is just like a, a recount of what, my experience in the place, no? What, what equipment uh, do you carry with you? It looks like, I mean, for some images, uh, in, some of these interior stuff, not the last one or this one, but we're using flash for some, like with yeah. was that ambient light, what, what, what equipment camera wise? Well, it's very simple. I have a Mamiya 7 with a, a 65 lens. And then the flash is on the camera and it bounces on the ceiling. No, usually I, I, at the end of the project, I was trying not to use any flash at all, which is kind of a challenge, but it was fun, you know, uh, but like this one, I don't have any flash in this one, but, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I prefer, I prefer to kind of uh, sway away from the flash. Although I do like the images that I use the flash in. Yeah, no, but, this but one doesn't. A six by uh, Mamiya six seven uh, with a digital back or or film? No, no, no. It's film. It's film. Yeah, yeah. This is this is like 2013 through 2017 that I did this project. So it was all film. It's crazy. I mean, the amount of film that I shot is ridiculous. It's like now I see my archive and I'm like, what am I gonna do with all this? Stuff? <laughs> Are you, you no longer shooting film with film? I Are am. You... Yeah, I'm still shooting film, but now I'm hybrid this is my first hybrid project the one i'm doing now i'm shooting film and digital and i'm actually using some of the digital digital prints uh, the one i'm going to show you next and so, some of the digital prints are actually oh no actually no i'm going to show you pencil oh my god i gotta start moving because I, I feel like i'm slow no i'm talking a lot or it's everything okay you guys will tell me no brandon kevin Okay, cool. So I, I actually, this is the only one I put a title in, <laughs> The Pencil of Nature. This is the uh, recent project that I finished um, uh, last year. And it, this is a, a project, again, about portraiture. I started it after I finished San Pedro Garza Garcia. Again, I went into photography, not to think about photography. I put these two images to start because this young gallery here in Mexico City called Salon Silicol invited me to a show where they had artists do a homage a homage to uh, uh, artists that they admired and of course i chose helmut newton <laughs> you know it's like it, helmut newton to me is like you know he's my super idol um so i did my homage to helmut newton were these two images that were in the show and I, I photograph my friends. One is an actress and the other one is not, but she's like, she's so beautiful that she could be. <laughs> but um, uh, again, I went back to, I, I shot these in Hasselblad with the black and white film. 
And again, uh, once I saw these pictures, I thought, oh my God, after doing San Pedro Garza Garcia, the intense sociological, you know, like a nego constant negotiation, I'm like, I, I thought, God, this, this really takes me again back to my beginnings, no? which is portraiture, photographing women, you know, that was another thing. So I started going into looking at photographs, no? and I decided that I was going to do a project where I looked at photography done. I'm, I'm here, I'm showing you obviously not my images. These are by Erwin Blumenfeld. No, I, I didn't know Erwin Blumenfeld until I did this project. Um, these two crazy images are also by him. And I started to look at male figures, no, like male photographers and what they're sort of, where they came from. I was, I became very interested in Erwin Blumenfeld as a figure and what he did in fashion, et cetera. Like I started to look at the history of photography again. So. What I did is I started at, at the same time, I'm sorry, I'm skipping a lot, but from the from these portraits, I started to photograph women. And also I started to do self-portraits uh, posing in male characters. Now these are obviously to, uh, I started doing these homages. Now this is a homage to Erwin Blumenfeld. And uh, obviously this, uh, I started to look back at images that I had pending uh, of just male uh, sort of, you know, male expressions of masculinity that I really like, like the Diana Arbus, Norman Mailer. This is Carlos Fuentes by, I can't remember the photographer's name. She's like a French photographer that worked in Mexico a lot. And I did my own homages of these images, no, with the self-portrait. The self-portraits became sort of an exercise, a uh, performative exercise of appropriation the appropriation of a, you know, like a male body or how you represent. So I was thinking about pose basically, like all these images are based around the idea of pose. Like that's the extension. The, the first project I was thinking about only portraiture and this project I was thinking about pose. So I began to photograph myself in one, in one end. No, this, these were my sort of my male characters interlaced with photographing women and looking at, you know, photographs done of women by men, always, no? Like how were men photographing women across time? No, and sort of my question was like, who constructed pose? So obviously it's, I, I called it the pencil of nature. I thought about this title a year or a year and a half into the project, sort of thinking like, let's think about the beginning of it. No, like how did we create the female pose and who created it? usually the people who were behind the camera were men so obviously the pose was created by four men no so I, I kind of thought let's see how can we explore this no and I started looking at the photographers that I've always loved and that I you know like Araki no and I was like where does Araki what what do women Araki's women are saying no about submission about how you know they all let themselves do this and this is his vision this is how he, he likes to see women no, so we I look at this and I started working specifically with actresses. No, I thought the actresses, uh, uh, these are mine, <laughs> Paulina Inaraki. I started actually titling the pictures uh, with the name of the photographer that we were looking at, no? So Paulina had just come back from Japan and he loved Araki, she loved Araki. So we did this experiment. No, and sort of like, how do we, like what was the, what was the expression of Araki's women? No, how are they posing? What is the submission? And I never thought about it, like putting, you know, obviously an actress can come up with something. And it was very interesting how working with actresses and sort of thinking about how do we represent them? And obviously Maplethorpe, which I always loved Maplethorpe. And I saw him in 1989, you know, when he was in, in the middle of, I mean, his show was in the middle of a huge thing. And, you know, I, the uh, uh, Maplethorpe's women are very different. No, I mean, how he represents women, um, uh, of course, everything he did with Lisa Lyon, and I and I photographed my sort of. This is another actress from here from Mexico called Claudette Mayer. Um, and so, and then after a while, I stopped doing this. Bring the book because I would bring the books and let's sit down and look at the books. No, so eventually, I just uh, you know I would just photograph and then I would find something and say, oh my god, this is exactly. I mean, I I do have an image that I love of. You know, I love the work of Philippe Halsman as well. This is 
my, as I mentioned before, my father studied in the famous photographer's course and Philip Hausmann was there. And many other photographers, obviously all men were in, the, in that list were part of the, my influences. No? So I, I was kept looking back at my influences. Now, could you show uh, the cover of, of, of the book and, 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 and let everybody know what, what the oh, yeah. where it comes from? Yeah, so, so I'll, I, I can talk very, you know, the pencil of nature, which is Henry, Henry, oh, no, William Henry. I thought it was Henry William Fox Talbot. Oh my God. Uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, an English scientist, politician, like wonderful, uh, wealthy guy, um, like photography, like uh, he was using the camera obscura in a, in a holiday in Lake Como, no? And he was doing the, a drawing with his camera obscura and then he said, oh my God, what if, you know, the, the image could just stay forever permanently on the paper. So he began to make experiments and he managed to get an image to stay on, on, a, on a piece of paper for, for a while. It didn't last forever. He actually started selling books called The Pencil of Nature, but unfortunately the images began to disappear. Uh, which for me is a beautiful idea that, you know, it's like you can't tame the image yet, you know? So I thought that was related to how you can't really tame a female image. No, you have to kind of go with the flow. It might disappear, it might change, it might transform. And I, and anyway, but Talbot made this beautiful book. And I mean, it, his texts are all very lovely as well about how they talk about each image. How he did the how he did that image? What it you know uh, he's analyzing the situations as a true and absolute beginner of photography, which he wasn't the only one. He was the English one. No, there was a French one. There was a, I don't know if there was an American one. No, there wasn't. Well, 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 the key about Talbot in a way is he really started us uh, on the road to modern photography because he uh, invented the negative process. So you the negative exactly from it. Whereas Niesp and then uh, Daguerre. Uh, was sort of a, an assistant to Niesp, even though Daguerre sort of comes down through history, you know, in 1839 as the father of a photography, yeah. Talbot's got to be given a lot of credit as well. And so that book mm -hmm. uh, just came out for those interested a couple of years ago. Uh, obviously, it's not the original edition. <laughs> it would be nice yeah, if people of us but you can that. see. Yeah, it's really lovely because it's like you can see all these images. You're right. I love that idea, the idea of the negative. Yeah. Is and it and actually I talk about it in my in the text that I wrote for this book. It's not in print yet. I'm I'm still uh, finding funding for it, but it's it's um it's a beautiful idea. And then you go you you fast forward to the '80s and already Richard Avedon is printing posters of Natasha Kinsky. You know, it's just the idea of reproduction. The snake it's and just all. Beautiful. That's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's beautiful. Sure. But um, yeah, the serpent. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So. Um, so anyway, so these are some of the, at the end of the, of the, of the project, I started actually doing some semi-nude images, which, you know, I, I had only one or two. And my friend, the actress was like, can you please ask women to let, you know, let you photograph them naked? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I had, you know, I think I loved it. I, I thought it was beautiful. And, and I got asked by them and I love having uh, you know, and some nudity. I mean, we're talking about female. It's like, how do uh, how does a woman represent herself? And it's sort of our choice and sort of uh, just trying to translate the way that I see women and the way, you know, how they seem strong and uh, capable and, and sort of, I don't know, I hope that comes through in the book. It always makes me nervous. It's like, is my vision male because it could be you know I, I learned from a very macho photographer <laughs> my dad no so who knows you, when you see the book you guys can tell me you know what it feels like no but it, usually they're all they're all natural light here I didn't use any any flash I really love the idea of working with the house of blood with the weight and the sound of the house of blood as the sort of like the guiding I did use digital that I photographed them uh, to not use that much film you know because you warm up a little bit with digital and then I would give them the digital images to share because they're all actresses so they like to have stuff for their for their you know social media and stuff like that and these are two pieces that I did for the exhibition that I had here in Mexico City this is my first three-dimensional exercises I did this one which was a small compact with um, sort of the, what's in it is a blood and made with resin 
and this space that I found at the at the flea market here called La Lagunilla, which is really beautiful. Um, and then this one, which is a homage, another one, to a Manuel Alvarez Bravo image. I don't have the that image here, I think. No, I don't have it. But it's a very, it's a beautiful image that Manuel Alvarez Bravo did. I, I, I didn't, as I grew up in Tijuana and studied in California and New York, Manuel Alvarez Bravo wasn't my, you know, he wasn't one of my teachers. I did not look at his photography, but I did look at his photography when I was doing this project because I was in Mexico City. And especially because I was gonna have a show at this gallery called Galeria Arte Mexicano, which opened with an exhibition that included Manuel Alvarez Bravo in a surrealist exhibition that Andres Breton did no? in, the, in the 30s, I believe. So it was kind of all historically linked and I thought it was, and I liked the importance of it. The picture of his is a dress that's on the, on the chair, uh, obviously in a real room. And here I sort of tried to recreate the room and the light, which was very difficult, but uh, we, I, I, I had help. Um, and then these are just some images from the show uh, that I really like. This is another one, uh, how much to Robert Longo. No, and this is another actress that I worked with. And these are some of the self portraits. Um, and then this is a view of the show. No, mm. I hadn't shown in Mexico City for like seven years when I had this show in 2019. It was a long time. I was so obsessed with San Pedro <laughs> that I was like, just San Pedro. And I showed in LA and, you know, I had the gallery that used to represent me called Shoshana Wayne in Los Angeles. But then, you know, I, and, and, and finally I had that exhibition. But anyway, I'm gonna finish with this project uh, called Sea of Cortez. This is my current project. And, and this one is linked to my family history. Um, I, this is the one I told you that I am doing a hybrid. No? So I'm shooting some digital, some film for the first time. Uh, so I'm going back to uh, the Sea of, uh, I, I imagine that you guys all know exactly where it is. The Sea of Cortez is that sea that's between the Baja California Peninsula and um, Sonora and Sinaloa sort of, you know, desert beach uh, states. And um, my, grandfa my, uh, my grandfather uh, was orphaned in a town, in a mining, mining town that's in the middle of the peninsula called Santa Rosalia. And I just, I'd never been to that town. I'd never actually explored the Baja California Peninsula, nor the other side. And I've always had a really intense fascination with that ocean, that that Sea of Cortez, I don't know the exact, the, how, what size it is, but it, it, it goes all through, you know, it's all uh, Baja California Peninsula and all around to this part of Sonora, which is desertic, but it, the beach is there. So you see the ocean and the desert. I've been there, but I haven't been there back to photograph just yet. And then, and then Sinaloa, which is a very kind of a spicy, sort of amazing state as well. And so what I'm doing is a very subjective documentary of this ocean. No, so I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sort of doing trips. No? So I travel, I, I go, I, the, my first trip, I went to La Paz, which is at the very almost, it's not quite at the end, the Cabos is at the end of the peninsula, but I go and I make these road trips and I find people to photograph. No, I'm, I, I really loved from uh, Pencil of Nature working with actresses. So I'm, I'm finding actors and people to photograph. No, this is not an actor. So I try to mix gener mix uh, all sorts of genres here, like do landscape photography, as well as some performative, as well as some portraits, you know, or just uh, people that I find along the way. But I'm really interested in the body and sort of the body in this territory sort of now it, I was thinking about the body with the pose and it's, it, you can see it expanded into here. But again, I'm working with color. I have started to add some black and white images. I'm also carrying black and white film with me when I do these trips. Now, after a year, it's a year ago exactly that I started the project. And I can say now that I want to do a black and white and color project. <laughs> no, because I wasn't sure in the beginning, no? But these what are all the last uh, building. What is that? This is a this is called they call it the Chute El Chute. This is in Santa Rosalia in that mining town. And so the the sort of the the mine or the how would you say where they separate the copper from the other stuff 
it was just it's, like a smelting or something i think they exactly call. the the fundidora you know like where they where they melt everything down they separate the bad stuff from the stuff that they do they do like which is the copper and all the shit basically would go through this into the ocean and so they threw all the it's obsidian basically it's the stuff that they didn't want which is amazing because it's full of energy and all sorts of properties but anyways thrown into the ocean and then the ocean threw it back at them huh. so all the sand in this sea in this uh, beach is black they have they call it black beach because they have actual black sand that's made out of obsidian it's fascinating but this is the object that all the stuff would go you know it was built in the 30s or in the 20s and it's kind of falling apart now but i thought it was just like an art piece it was like cristo you know like it's just incredible no this this piece but yeah it looks this... so put together that it didn't even look like it ever could have been a real building yeah no exactly it wasn't a building it was more like a, they call it the chute which is you know like an object and in the middle there was like a i don't know how they did it i don't know the mechanics of it but it was just like the, this is right behind me was basically the sea yeah no so it's like it's what it the transport <laughs> of the shit <laughs> they call it the escoria i don't know exactly what it's called in english escoria is sort of the leftover or the things that doesn't work no the, the uh, trash basically sure. this is an actor that i worked with in tijuana because as a, a subjective tijuana is not exactly next to the sea of cortez but it is where i grew up where my grandfather ended up and you know i'm kind of just cre that's how how i am sort of moving along this project is like, oh, I have a feeling, I think I should go to this place, no, or I have landscape that I've seen driving by that I wanna spend time in. So, which is the next trip that I'm gonna do, I'm going back to Sonora. No, I haven't actually haven't been there, but I wanna go, I've seen pictures of this crater that I wanna go photograph and finding in every, every town or city that I go to, I just put on Facebook and Instagram, I'm looking for actors, dancers, people to photograph and I get answer. That's how I found this uh, amazing guy, you know? Obviously I do a lot of pictures that maybe don't work and I photograph a lot of people that maybe don't work for the project, but it's always wonderful to be busy <laughs> and finding people that are, and trying to just figure out what I, you know, what I want to be doing, you know? This is another mine in the, uh, across from Santa Rosalia, that's, uh, they basically mine chalk. No, cal is that white yeah, chalk, material. Chalk is right. Chalk, yeah. and this is an explosion that happened when we were there, which was just, uh, I loved it, it was beautiful. And so I started to add this sort of black and white layer because people in this these towns or little towns, Santa Rosalia particularly, are very much into their history. They really talk about the history of the town. The French, you know, used to have the concession, Porfirio Diaz gave it to them. They didn't have to pay any taxes. They they basically exploited the land and left. But there are like I keep finding people, uh, descendants from these French people. I'm also I have a French last name. My my great grandfather was a French priest, <laughs> French Catholic priest that ended up marrying a woman, a Yaki woman. So I'm adding this black and white layer where I I look at the things that for me could have been there a hundred years ago. No, and so this is, uh, there was, uh, as I was working with actors in Santa Rosalia, there are these actors that recreate to, uh, sort of images or situ archival images. And I just thought it was so beautiful that they recreate archival images. So I, I started, you know, I photographed them in costume. And then, you know, like these, I love them, these women, obviously a lot of the pictures are playing their role, but the ones that I like is the one where they're all kind of staring blankly into the camera, no? This is, these are actual Jackie dancers that are still exist, live in Santa Rosalia or in that area. And, um, and this is finally, this is the last image, is uh, the, the mine, the actual mine called El Boleo, no? And it says, thank you, fabulous people. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing, no? So we can see our faces. And I will unmute. I got to remember to hit that button. So no, the ah. stuff. And so so the it's you're continuing on with uh, the whole Baja area and Sea of Cortez. That's going to continue on for a while. 
It is. I have a grant that uh, I got a grant here from Mexico. That's a three year grant. So I have two more years to work on this project. And I think for me, it's enough, but who knows? I keep saying that three years is enough, but I might need another. I, 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 you know, it's, um, I, I find I took control of it uh, in this last trip. I said, okay, I got to stop being so subjective, you know, <laughs> like I have to decide and choose certain situations that I want to photograph and what I want it to look like. And that's, I just came out with that, this idea of doing this parallel between historic and in the present. I'm going to have a small show like here in Mexico City in a few weeks where I'm for the first time I'm going to show them black and white and color sort of paired and see what happens. No, that's kind of my experiment for the for the month. No. And how, yeah. how many people get your books? So, so how many books do you um, have? I have? I published four and you can find them usually on Amazon or yeah, Amazon RM. Some of them are not available. There was one that was a big hit, which was the one I did about a, a soap opera and a pop a group. And that still has a very large fan base. So that was my big seller, you know, my bestseller. <laughs> but then uh, if you look online on Amazon, there are still some of the other ones of the, 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 the one I just published or just published two, two years ago um, or three years ago, San Pedro, you can still find copies of. Great. And uh, somebody is asking, uh, could you remind us uh, when your exhibitions, uh, upcoming exhibitions are? In where, Long I Beach. Mean, yeah. Oh, well, right back well, home, sort of. I'm so excited. That's where I was born. I love it. So yeah, at, in Long Beach, I don't have the exact date, but I know it's in the second week of June. I mean, the third week of June and of what, this year. And what's the name of the place? It's, it's the Museum of Latin American Art, MOLA. Okay, MOLA. Excellent. Good. So people can, can check you down there. And uh, somebody, uh, uh, Luisa wrote, uh, thanks. To you, Yvonne, love Mexico City, so enjoy it very much. Um, and so, why Mexico City? What, because you, you, your folks are, are they still? They're in, still in, they're they live in San Diego. My parents. San Diego now. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, when I when I I lived in New York, it was the actual first time as an adult that I lived in the United States. I love New York, but I I just couldn't. I couldn't deal with it. Obviously, my second choice was Los Angeles, especially after I finished my MFA in San Diego. But I, I don't know. I just kind of, um, I always, I had already worked in Mexico City. I had already, I have a, I had already had a group of people that I, that I'm close to. I didn't have a gallery. I didn't, I, I wasn't necessarily having a, a, you know, like an art career here yet. But um, but I just my my I met my husband uh, while I was start, uh, studying or starting my MFA, and he's from England, but he's lived in Mexico City for about twenty five years. So it was just kind of like you know a negotiation. It was kind of hard to for me to take me out of San Diego. I was actually kind of getting really into it, you know. And I had a baby, so I was like, mm. I kind of like my San Diego baby, but. Huh. eventually he worked his powers and we ended up in Mexico City and the first year was really hard I mean for me like the first year in Mexico City was like what am I gonna do you know like it was intense and I had this great grant and uh, while I was in the MFA so I was kind of like I have no grant I have no job what are we gonna do so eventually you know I got the hang of it I'm I, I'm quite happy here now obviously the pandemic was hard <laughs> in this city it was kind of like we should have left but it's too late now yeah. But um, but now it's coming back to you know functional reality. So so we're happy. I'm happy to be here in Mexico City, and, and you are welcome anytime. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll, I will take you up on it. And, and Mexico City really does have a great tradition of art photography. I mean, where Manuel Abres Bravo and, and uh, Graciela Iturbide was there. Yes. Lola Alvarez. I guess he inspired a couple of people. So yeah. it's interesting for you to speak about. Uh, you know, Bravo. Um, yeah, and yeah. There was a it, great photo school down there. I don't know if it's still. Uh, I remember Christina Rodero um, was there mm -hmm. as a visiting teacher for a while uh, years ago. Uh, do you know if it's still around? She probably. She probably went to Centro de Imagen, which is it's still that's around. That's they that's still that's have it. a one-year program, and it's 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 great. It's really a photography's place in Mexico City. It's not as clear as 
you know, it's not like, it's a little bit separate still from art, unfortunately. Mm. There are many art, uh, contemporary art galleries that carry photography, but it's, it's not exactly like, our place is not, uh, you know, it, it, there, are, there is a history, there is, Graceli Turbide is a wonderful artist. She's still uh, practicing and she still lives here in Mexico City, also in the south of Mexico City. Um, a few years ago, uh, a gallerist told me that she sold much better abroad than she sold in Mexico which mm. is possible. It's possible that it's not current anymore, that, you know, that um, comment. But um, I, I think that the market is growing. It's not exactly, uh, you know, like uh, as stable as it is in other parts, maybe like maybe California, maybe Paris, or, you know, like, but there is, it is growing and there's a, a lot of attention being put on photography. And there's a, a lot of amazing photographers in Mexico. I'm really kind of very proud of the sort of, I mean, I teach some, Sometimes I don't, I'm not a full, I'm not a full-time teacher profile because I can't do it. I, I get bored very easy. <laughs> no, but, um, but I like doing workshops and I, and I tend to follow up on my students and everything. And there's a lot going on that I think is, is fabulous. No, it's okay. great. Where are you teaching? Well, I, now I teach privately. Like I actually oh, okay. create my own workshops and, and put it online and say, I'm doing a 10 group portrait, you know, and document, I call it Retrato y Documento, which is, Talking about portraiture, but also talking about projects, no? And and I and I get a now I'm in COVID. I did a couple of Zoom ones, but I got eventually tired of doing Zoom, and I just started doing presential. I did my last one like in November, no December actually, and I meant to do one soon because I start to get a lot of messages like, "When are you doing the next one?" kind of thing, nice. and I'm gonna do one in Tijuana as well for sure. Oh. That, that's yeah. Cool. Good. So, so I guess we could. Uh, any final thoughts? I guess we we, we hit the, the bell in terms of time. And I don't could, know. Uh, any that, any more questions? Yeah. And please, no, anybody think... have any questions? You guys can uh, feel free to ask a question. You can unmute. Ask. A question Thanks for sticking around. Up. Thanks for sticking wow. around. I know I was a little bit like I I kind of feel a little rusty with my English. I don't know what's going on. It's like I had COVID a month ago. And I do feel a bit like I haven't taken the ginkgo biloba yet, you know. <laughs> like I should be taking it. <laughs> well, you, you sound you sound fine. Uh, really? but how, I feel like it, it's not it, quite. Did it hit you, you know? pretty hard or not too bad? No, it was very mellow, but it hit me hard emotionally because I was I was in Tijuana to see my dad, to see my parents, mm. and I couldn't visit them because I got COVID on the way. Some at some point. So it was kind of uh, like I arrived at my parents. I did the, you know, that those exams like before. I, I said hi with the, you know, with the the cover thing, and oh, dad, yeah. I love you, I love you, kind of thing. And then I did one exam, and it was positive, and then I did another, it was positive, and I was back to Tijuana to a hotel to try to. <laughs> So it was very that. frustrating, but uh, yeah, actually, physically, luckily, it wasn't too bad. But I do feel a bit like a little mushy on my brain. But I am gonna do the ginkgo biloba thing, definitely. Well, I, maybe maybe I had COVID because I always feel mushy. But then I, <laughs> that, that predates the pandemic. I mean, I think no, I've I think you know what? Thirty years. I find I find that traveling a lot does it to me as well. But I guess you're so so used to it. I mean, this thing about oh, just getting back from a month and a half is like I've never said that. Like I've never done that. I've never been gone for a month and a half anywhere. Yeah, Incredible. I'm not used to being here. It's, it's, it's if, if I'm in LA for more than a couple of weeks in a row, I, I, I mean, I'm like go. a tibet on, you know, bouncing off. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got to always keep moving. So, but the, Yvonne, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Fantastic.